Hi everyone, welcome to Last Minute Maths again. And uh, in this video, we're going to be covering radioactivity, which is uh, usually in everyone's physics paper one. All right. And um, it's a heavy topic, so I'll try and run through it as quickly as possible, make the video as short as possible. Before I do jump in, uh, please remember if you find it useful, then uh, do subscribe and switch on the notifications as I'll be launching videos um, or try on every couple of days or daily basis. All right, um, straight in, radioactivity, all right? Based on the structure of an atom, all right? As we know, all atoms have a nucleus, which is made up of particles called protons and neutrons, all right? And the electrons uh, orbit the nucleus at different energy levels. That's what, in chemistry, for example, those of you who do chemistry, uh, are shells, all right? So, you know, the usual kind of uh, diagram that we get. There's a nucleus, and then you've got electron orbit, another orbit, etc. all right? And the electrons go around in those shells. Okay, what about the nucleus then? All right, and that's the bit that we're most interested in as far as radioactivity goes. So, in a nucleus, Today's knowledge is that we have protons, neutrons concentrated in the center and electrons around it. But uh, the history of it was, you know, um, at the beginning when scientists first talked about atoms and particles, etc., they thought it was something like a, a plum pudding model, all right? Basically, the uh, atom was considered to be positive matter, all right? evenly spread, okay? So a solid positive lump, if you like, where the electrons were actually embedded, all right, in the solid matter, all right, the solid positive, etc. all right? And these were thought to be like plums in a plum pudding. Now, I've never tried a plum pudding, and um, I'm not sure if they put them with the plums in or the seeds in or God knows what. If anybody knows, put it in the comments, all right? I'm sure... I'd love to be educated about that. All right. The development of that, as people got a little wiser and got more information, was the Rutherford model. And this is the one that um, most of you will remember the diagram for. Um, you've got some gold metal, sort of like a, and it can be aluminium if you like. It's a metal foil like that. All right. Um, and they shoot some positive alpha particles. Now, we'll explain the alpha particles a little bit later. All right, details of it. Just say positive particles for now are shot in towards the metal foil. And the metal foil has these metal nuclei, right? There we go. And so what happens is some of the um, positive alphas are seen to go in and be diverted, right? So they're sort of diverted from their straight path. Others will go straight through, and some are even bounced back, right? They head back that way. What this tells us is that the nuclei, or atoms, right, are concentrated at center, hence nucleus, um, the atom is mostly empty, All right? shown by the fact that uh, some of them pass straight through. So that was the first inkling that you had some form like an atom with a nucleus in the middle, all right? And they didn't know quite what was in it or what was going on around it, but at least the Rutherford experiment, the model, showed that there was something in the center and a huge amount of empty space around it. The next development was Bohr's model, all right? And this was the one that, um, you know, led us to what we know today. Basically, you've got um, electrons orbiting the 
the nucleus. Okay, um, and you've got different energy levels. And the other thing that was shown is that the electrons themselves can actually, if I were to put one there, for example, they can move, right? So electrons can transition from level to level, up or down. Okay, um, up, if they move outwards, it's energy going in, and if they go down, then they're giving energy out, all right? So absorbing energy, that's in, and the electron moves up uh, to a higher energy level, and down is energy given out, so emission, all right? So this one, absorption, this will say absorb, and this one emit energy. All right. Okay, I won't dwell on this. It um, gets a little bit tedious, so I'll try and keep it uh, more to the point for you guys. Uh, simple things you need to know about the atom, and those of you, again, who are doing uh, you know, physics paper one and might be doing chemistry as well, atomic number is simply the number of protons in a nucleus. And that is absolutely critical because it identifies what element it is. All right, so if a nucleus has a certain number of protons in it, then it tells you what that element is. Change the number of protons and you change what element uh, it comes from. All right, so under normal circumstances, that doesn't change, but of course we're doing radioactivity, so we're going to start breaking those rules. Right, the mass number, okay, uh, number of protons plus neutrons, and I think I'll just stick a little diagram in there. Um, you know, you have your usual box, and you've got your uh, element X, and up at the top, you've got the mass number, and down in the corner, you've got the atomic number, all right? That's how you'll find it in the periodic table. Okay, next thing, isotopes, all right? Um, atoms of the same element, okay? Same element, which means has same protons, but have different number of neutrons, okay? So, for example, car what's called carbon-12 and carbon-14. They both have six protons, but this one, carbon-14, has eight neutrons. All right? Whereas carbon-12 only has six. Right, so that's what um, is meant by isotopes. Okay, the next thing, radioactive decay. Um, it's seen that some nuclei are unstable and uh, become stable by emitting radioactivity. So they're actually sort of like popcorn popping, right? Um, please don't use that in an exam or an answer or anything like that. It's just a, an idea, right? Um, just to help you visualize what's going on. And um, usually this happens with uh, large nuclei. which have too many neutrons uh, compared to protons, let's say. Oh, sorry. All right. 
It's often the case, but it's not uh, a hard and fast rule. It's just an indication. All right. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible so you can get as much information as quickly as possible. All right, the first kind of uh, radioactivity that's emitted is an alpha particle. All right, this is basically made up of two protons and two neutrons, okay, in a lump. And the symbol for an alpha is the Greek letter alpha, and you've got a 4 2 there. All right, so it has a mass. Of four, and uh, if you like, an atomic number uh, number of two. Now, an atomic number of two means that it's actually a helium nucleus. All right. So often it can be written in some places as that. So it's a he helium nucleus, no electrons, right? No electrons. So it's got a charge of plus two. So it's like a helium nucleus, or you could call it a helium ion. Right? And that's an alpha. Now, the important thing about alpha is when an alpha is emitted, right, the atomic number of the nucleus that it's coming from goes down by two, and the mass number goes down by 4. And an example here is thorium. Okay, So thorium 228 and an atomic number of 90. So the mass is 228, atomic number is 90. That will decay to becoming uh, radium. Right? We can sometimes radium gas, but radium. 224 is the mass number and the atomic number 88, and an alpha particle, all right? Notice how the 228, right, equals 224 plus 4, and the 90 equals 88 plus the 2. So it all balances, all right? That's the principle of that. Okay, um, beta particle. It's a single electron. All right. Um, and how is it formed? A neutron in the nucleus breaks down and forms a proton and an electron. Okay. The proton stays. The electron leaves. Okay. Very simply put. All right. So when a beta is emitted, the atomic number goes up right goes up by one why because a new proton is created all right and an example of that is radioactive potassium will decay into um, stable calcium all right and emit um, a beta particle, so that's uh, basically an electron that's flying around at very high speed. Okay, all right, self-explanatory there. Gamma is the third type, and this is not a particle. You know, that's very important. The other two were particles. This is not a particle. All right, so this is electromagnetic wave energy. So it's basically waves being given out, all right? has no effect on the atomic or mass number, all right? It's just energy being given out in waveform. There is a fourth that I've left out because I want to come back to it later on. Um, it's called fission neutrons. And that's a different type of radioactivity, which I'll address right at the uh, end of the video. Uh, where it actually fits in more appropriately. Now, in terms of the different types of radiation, the penetrating ability, which is part of, like, its safety measures and risks. Okay? Um, well, an alpha is a big fat particle compared to other things. And it gets stopped by, 
there we go, paper, a sheet of paper is enough to stop alpha. All right, won't get past a sheet of paper. Uh, metal foil, so I don't know, um, aluminium if you like, just any form of metal foil, all right, thin foil will stop beta. Okay, so that's stop alpha, that will stop beta. Um, and gamma will penetrate both of those and get through to, for example, a thick layer, uh, several inches, if not a foot or something, um, of lead or several feet of concrete. All right. And then gamma is stopped by those. All right. Now, why is this stuff dangerous or we want to stop it with things, you know, protection, etc., etc.? is this ionizing effect. That's the actual danger of radiation. When radioactive emissions hit other atoms, all right, um, electrons can be removed. Okay, so electrons removed, right? It turns these atoms into ions. Okay, so they become charged particles, which can then interact with particles around them and uh, change the nature of a substance or cause things to behave differently. That's where the problem is. Very specifically, right, they cause harm. For example, in human cells, uh, they can damage the DNA, they can damage your mitochondria, your ribosomes, etc., in, 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 in a human cell, and um, as a result, cause things to malfunction or dysfunction and often can lead to cancer and create tumors, all right? A uh, couple of definitions next. Exposure means something has uh, been irradiated. So it just means if it's been exposed, but does not itself become radioactive, then that is simply irradiated. Means, you know, you've been hit by some radiation, but not necessarily it's stuck to you or is inside you. Presence of radioactive material, and this is the, the more dangerous one if you like. Presence of radioactive material is where something is contaminated. All right? So then it itself starts emitting radioactivity. All right? And that's the one that everybody is worried about. This is dangerous. Okay. Right, let's move on swiftly. The part that a lot of people have the most problem with in this whole topic um, is the count rates and half-life, all right? And I'll try and keep it really to the point so that you're not distracted by any other information. The activity, right, rate of activity, is a number of atoms that decay per second, yeah? And using our popcorn, it's... How many um, corn, you really should say kernels of corn, but how many corn pop per second? All right, that's effectively what this is equivalent to. And it's measured in units called becquerels, and the symbol is a BQ. All right, you probably won't need that in your exam, but it's just worth knowing. The count rate right, um, is basically the number of beeps or whatever in a Geiger-Muller counter. That's the equipment, special equipment used to measure radioactivity, i.e. how radioactive something is. Obviously, the greater the activity, the, the more radioactive something is, and the higher the count rate. So activity and count rate sometimes are interchangeable, all right? And you may see this thing, G-M tube. That's a Geiger-Muller tube, all right? It's just an automatic piece of equipment that, um, you know, has this sort of like crackling sound when it uh, comes across uh, radioactive uh, material and so on and so forth, all right? Um, activity in radioactive material is random, all right? Very fundamental principle. You don't know which nuclei, are going to decay at any given time. If you've got like a um, hundred kernels of corn in your microwave, you don't know which one's going to pop next, but they will keep popping at a steady rate. That's the thing to remember. The activity count rate is proportional 
to the number of nuclei present. All right. So initially, you've got a lot of nuclei. All right. So you've got a large decay rate. As some of them decay, the um, number decreases. Um, so in this one, you'll find that uh, it's a, probably the best way to write it is decreased and decreased even more. Uh, fewest. No, I'm not going to labor that point. I'm just going to say it decreases even more. There's more detail to it, but you don't need it. Okay, so going back to our microwave with the uh, popping corn in there, right? Initially, you've got a certain number of uh, uh, kernels, and they're popping away happily. So there are fewer corn kernels left to pop. So as you go along, the number of pops will actually decrease, all right? Because the number of uh, corn kernels left yet to pop also decrease. I hope that actually makes sense, all right? So, you know, as I've just said, there are fewer of them, so the decay rate decreases as the amount of the substance decreases, all right? This brings us to the bit that everybody keeps asking about, all right? Um, Half-life, okay? Um, the time taken for number of unstable nuclei to halve, all right? And that can also be described as the activity or the count rate to become half of whatever you're starting with. So, for example, if you have a million, you know, you're going to 500,000, then you go to 250,000, and then to 125,000. The time taken for each halving is the same. Call it T if you like, all right? It's the same. So, after one half life, you've got half. After two half lives, you've got a quarter. After three half-lives, you've got an eighth. All right? A little diagram um, I've taken from an open source, all right? Um, and it's using Cobalt, all right? Cobalt 60 as a substance to just observe. And what it's saying is that starting with 100%, so the amount that you had, so let's say 10 grams, uh, the time it takes to get to 5 grams, okay, so 50% of the original, is one half-life, right? So that's basically half. Then another half-life takes us to 25%. So there's your 50, there's your 25%. And that basically is for it to become a quarter, and so on, okay? So that's one-eighth and... Uh, hang on, have I just done this? Yep, that's right. And uh, so on. So you just keep going like that, all right? So that's halving, that's quarter, an eighth by the time you get there. And uh, the last one, one thirty second, if you like, all right? Just to illustrate that, all right, and there's a reason I really want people to notice what's going on here. Um, it's these fractions. Okay, so after one half-life, one, you've got A naught times half. Two half-lives, okay, so two, you've got A naught times a quarter, and so on. The formula for this, right, please take note of that, and remember the times remain constant, the intervals remain constant, okay? The thing that you need to know is that, all right, the amount you have or the activity rate, okay, both of these things can be expressed by the same formula, is the initial rate, okay, times half to the power n. So after n half lives, it's a naught or n naught, whatever you've been given as your formula, times a half to the power n. That is really the crucial bit there, okay? All right. Um, if anybody wants any more clarification on that or a separate discussion on Half-Life, please drop it in the comments, and I will try and uh, add more detail. Right, I'm going to try and wrap this up as quickly as possible now. Uses of radioactivity, all right? Um, briefly put, 
um, medicine, all right? You use traces um, to insert in the body, so injected into the body, or sometimes put into, for example, um, potato, right? Uh, mashed potato. So I think they call it barium mash. And uh, barium is used in that to look at how food moves through the gut and um, whether there are any blockages, any problems, and so on and so forth. The material that's introduced into the body will emit radiation in very small doses, so it doesn't do too much damage, or in fact, it shouldn't do any damage at all. Um, but it can be detected by sensors outside the body, so it can be traced. People can see, doctors can see how the substance is moving through the body, are there any problems anywhere, um, where it's being absorbed, and so on and so forth, all right? Diagnosis. The important part of it is that these substances will have a very short um, half-life so that they'll come out of the body or decay down to nothing very quickly. So, for example, radioactive or trace iodine has an eight-day half-life. So within like a month, month and a half, etc., you're getting to a point where it's down to a negligible fraction. Okay. Another type of radiation that's used um, is the gamma. Okay. Um, obviously, it's not uh, emitting anything. It's stuff that's sort of like shot at the body, if you like, gamma rays are directed at the body to treat cancer, okay? Um, can destroy cancer cells or tumors um, to lesser or greater extent. And the other use for that is imaging, a bit like x-rays, right? All right. Um, but the images come out different and can be more detailed than x-rays. Right, industry. Um, another one is beta um, emission, beta particles. So here you've got beta particles. Can be used to measure thickness of materials, right? So, for example, you've got some form of uh, metal foil, cardboard, um, etc. being produced in very thin cardboard, or even paper. But you know, like the kitchen foil that we get from the shops, right? When that's rolled out, to make sure that it's of the right thickness, um, beta um, particles, electrons, are shot through, okay? If the foil is too thick, the beta won't go through. And if it's too thin, then the beta is going to go straight through and there'll be too much of it. So the machine, the GM tube, which is what I mentioned earlier on, um, can detect the count rate, okay, uh, the count rate tells us how thick uh, foil is, all right? And that machine then controls the equipment to either make it thinner or thicker um, accordingly, all right? Okay, last part of this. Um, the, perhaps the most important or most significant use of radioactivity for humans and in human life is for energy. All right? Many developed countries are now practically dependent on nuclear energy as a, a cheap and easy source um, of energy and to try and move away from uh, fossil fuels and all the other associated pollution and difficulties climate change, greenhouse gases, etc. All right. So the first type is fission. Okay. Um, when a nucleus splits, it releases energy, but it also sends out what I mentioned earlier, the fourth type of um, radiation, which is fission neutrons. So when a nucleus splits, it actually sends out uh, fission neutrons, okay, and in in most cases, without going into too much detail, uh, let's assume that there are three neutrons. Every time a nuclear splits like this, or is split by something, three neutrons are given out. These then, um, obviously, as they scatter, they will go and hit three other nuclei, all right, three more nuclei, 
which then emit more neutrons. Okay, so just a very simple schematic thing here. Your first fission neutron hits a nucleus, so that's your nucleus there, and that emits three more. Okay, get split, and then again, that's sort of just going along there, etc., and hits another three, and they emit nine, and so on. Okay. So you can see it's a chain reaction, and it's exponential. Meaning it just gets faster and faster. Oops. There we go. Faster and faster. All right, so this is why uh, nuclear uh, energy is produced in very, very controlled environments, because it is expansional exponential, sorry, and um, can quickly get out of control and can do a lot more harm than it does in terms of uh, good by producing energy. Um, I'm doing this after a whole day's worth of teaching, so I'm not going to start drawing out nuclear um, reactors and things, but just to illustrate a point, again with some open source um, uh, images here, the main parts that you're interested in are the fuel elements. Here, okay, that's the yellow yellow thing there. Okay, that's usually made up of uranium, and what's probably the best? I'm just going to use this. It's actually just U two three eight, right? But I'll write that for short. With let's say two percent of U two three five. Okay. And it's this stuff that's the actual fuel. Okay. I hope you can see that on the screen well enough. Right, so that's the fuel element. Um, next thing you've got the moderator. The moderator is actually something in the form of either, um, you know, oil or water even. Okay. It's a material that slows the neutrons down after they've been emitted. Okay, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Finally, another important bit, the control rods. Okay, this is absolutely critical. Without these, um, reaction goes out of control. All right? Uh, stops uh, reaction... going explosive, if you like. All right. And rest of it, um, you know, as that happens, heat is generated. So there's heat in there. And that heat is then taken to an exchanger like that. Okay. Um, the material in the... Uh, steam generator is not actually exchanged. The coolant goes back, okay? And this stuff is the water, okay? The two materials are never actually uh, mixed. They're kept separate, all right? And that's how you've got a, a turbine or something like that running there and creates electricity. Right, won't dwell on that any further. The definitions I gave a little while ago, moderator, slows neutrons down, okay, in fact, I'll add that there, okay, slows neutrons down, otherwise the nuclei won't be split properly, okay, um, that ensures that more neutrons are then emitted by the uh, following nuclei. Control rods, as I've just said, prevent the reaction getting out of control, so that's a safety feature, absolutely essential. And the fuel rods, um, already set up there, uranium-235, symbol is um, sometimes written like that, or also like that, okay? Um, that's the actual fuel, but there's only about 2% of it, 2, 3 maybe percent of it, and the rest of the fuel rod is made up of uranium-238, which can't be split, 
all right? Um, and that basically holds the uranium-235 in place, keeps it safe. Lastly, I hope um, all of that's understood so far, fusion, okay? This is apparently the, the future of mankind. Well, we'll see. When nuclei collide, all right, they can merge and make new nuclei, all right? That process um, happens, is happening all the time in stars, like, for example, our sun, all right? And um, it's sort of new elements are made in stars through this process. It releases much, much, much more energy, right? Huge amounts of energy compared to any other form like fission or anything else that we can do. The problem with that is it requires huge amounts of pressure, temperature, and speed. The nuclei that are colliding have to be really squeezed or squashed together, very high pressure, and at high temperature, which means that they've got really high kinetic energy and therefore high speed. Then you stand a chance of actually breaking down the nucleus and recreating a new nucleus. All right, um, and it's not easy to control. Um, it, it's like setting off a, an atom bomb, and in fact, um, the the ones that were dropped in World War Two were of this type. All right, and often we talk about hydrogen bombs and so on and so forth, but there is work going on and. Uh, several places in America and in the UK and um, I'm sure other places where they've managed to create one or two little sparks of fusion but not at a level that can be used um, regularly as yet. Something for the future. All right. The final bits that I want to talk about, um, the sort of things that come up in questions, are what are the, the, the problems with nuclear energy? All right. Safety. Is the first one. If things, and I've mentioned it, control rods and other things, if, if there's a leak or something goes out of control, whole thing explodes, you get a situation like uh, Chernobyl back in the 80s in um, northern Ukraine. Um, that is an area that's been completely contaminated. Right? Uh, the Chernobyl power plant exploded. It had a catastrophic explosion. Recently, we've had, uh, I think it's Fukushima in Japan, where it leaked. It was not an explosion, but it leaked, all right? So that's contaminated the town and the environment around it. So safety is an issue. And the other is waste pollution, all right? What do you do with the uranium fuel rods when they've gone down to a point where their activity rate and after you know, using them, um, they've gone down to a point where they're not very productive anymore. They're not giving out much energy or many neutrons anymore. What do you do with them? Okay, And you cannot just get rid of them right? Um, because they keep emitting radioactivity, right? uranium, for four and a half billion years, believe it or not. So the uranium half-life is four and a half billion years. So if you have that stuff lying on your lawn or you stick it in a bin somewhere, it's going to be popping radiation at people and things and animals, the environment, for another four and a half billion years. So it's not going away. If you spill that stuff anywhere, it is there forever, as far as us humans are concerned. Um... Carbon-14 right, has a half-life of about, let's say, 5,700 years by comparison. We mentioned iodine earlier on, and that's like eight days, and so on and so forth. So these are sort of things that you might want to consider um, if it comes up in questions. All right, I hope I've covered everything that people need. Please refer to the advanced information uh, because some elements may or may not be included in your exam, and it's up to you to make sure you perhaps uh, focus on the bits that you do need. If you watched all the way to the end, thank you very much for your time, and um, I hope it helps in some way, just concisely. 
And if you have liked it, please do subscribe and switch on the notifications. Or um, if you feel I can improve on this, please drop me a comment and any helpful suggestions would be very much appreciated. Very best of luck with your exams. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.